Now that we've seen the asset properties for our database, let's look at how Rails tries to help out uh, with it. And the key is, is here, these locking records for update. In, in general, a database is, is going to want to provide exclusive access to what you're working on, and that, that will provide all of the different uh, atomic and isolation properties that, that you want to see. And so there are two possible solutions that Ruby provides, and these are optimistic locking and pessimistic locking. Uh, and and so their names kind of kind of give a, a hint towards maybe the viewpoint that you want to look like, at. But before we explore those, we need to kind of understand how Rails uh, is set up even more deeply than than we have in the past. So uh, what we what we want to do here is is think about what what's going on. So with with Rails. We, we've got our, our requests coming in. So this is our, our server, and it, we have a request coming in. And that comes into our, our web server. Uh, maybe that is um, Apache or uh, Nginx uh, or you know whatever web server you're running. But in general, what that server is just going to do is it's going to see that request and see that it's designed for Rails. And so it's going to pass that request on to some Rails process. And, and now th this is the key. This is uh, usually this whole process is what's called single threaded. And so what's going on here is we're only going to allow uh, one request at a time to progress. So if, if we have multiple people hitting our server, then we're going to serialize automatically by this architecture the requests. And so automatically we don't have to worry about isolation because we're getting serialization going on. And and so while this Rails request is, is taking place, we kind of put on a queue any other requests that are ha happening. Uh, but the what can happen is Apache or Nginx or any of these things can have multiple servers and so as a, a result of, of that yeah, let's put the server up here each one of these can be making requests to different rails objects and so each server here is going to be connecting to a different rails process like this but only one request at a time and then these rails processes are somehow going to connect to the our our database engine th that that we have running and so most of the time if if we have one request running on on this rails process and if we don't have these other service requests we don't really have to worry about concurrency inside of our Rails process. As soon as the server starts spawning and adding Rails processes, then we do. And then oftentimes what we might do is because this right here is on a, a single machine hardware server, we might replicate that and so we might have a second or third or fourth uh, server so that that request can come into them as well and that gets replicated as well and uh, and so we need to be able uh, to do this uh, because that facilitates what is called scaling uh, if we have a large website I don't care how good of a server and rails process you have 
where they're going to run out of uh, memory capacity, network capacity, um, number of processes that can run memory, um, connections to the database, whatever, there's going to be an issue and so we're going to have to add more machines to it. So eventually we're going to want to build these up. But um, a lot of processes start small with just this single server right here with this single Rails process talking to a, a single database right here. And so because of that, Rails will um, provide what's called opportunistic, or as they like to, to call it, um, um, not pessimistic, but uh, um, now I'm drawing a blank. Uh, optimistic. There we go. Oops, right here. Let's get optimistic. Locking, which basically says we're going to assume that usually uh, there are no conflicts. And and so what we're going to do is we're not even going to take advantage of any sort of mechanism that's that's built into the database that provides locking and exclusive control over those things. We will um, just check to make sure nothing happened. Whereas um, pessimistic. is uh, uh, relying on the database to prevent conflicts. And that's usually uh, via locking. Okay. Whereas with opportunistic, we're going to do all of this in, in Rails. And, and the assumption is most of the time that doesn't happen, so we don't have to, to worry about things. And it, even if you scale up, like we're talking about here, with many, many server processes and Rails processes and hardware connecting to the database, most of the time, most websites are not having activity that's in conflict with each other. So if I'm shopping, on Amazon while you're shopping on Amazon we might be shopping for completely different books uh, and so ha having to assume that we're going to shop for the same items is in the wording of rails pessimistic because that's assuming the worst let's be optimistic and assume the the best and then try to fix things if, if they break uh, and and you can think about this in a number of ways. If you're blogging, you're going to be writing a different blog than someone else. So if you're commenting on a blog, you're probably going to be commenting on a different blog than someone else. Even if you're at a site like Twitter, there are more people tweeting unique new things than are retweeting and, and looking at the, the same content and so forth. And so oftentimes, scaling a, a website is able to get away with this kind of optimistic perspective because most users don't conflict with, with each other. And in fact, uh, if you talk to some people, the only way that you can possibly efficiently do this kind of scaling is with this optimistic locking. Because as soon as you go into this kind of pessimistic role and you've got all these different things being serialized by one database system, it, you've lost all the ability to utilize the concurrency that these machines ha have to offer. And so you have to operate under an opportunistic me mechanism in order to succeed. Uh, because we um, 
basically eliminate the database locking from the normal flow of events. And, and so we don't have serialization taking place. We, we do have concurrency. Now some high p power databases you know, maybe like an Oracle or something, say, but we have finely tuned our databases to be able to, to handle this kind of thing. And so uh, that, that's a, a debate for uh, another talk on whether you can highly scale and get good performance uh, only with opportunistic versus pessimistic locking. But you need to understand what's going on. So for the next two episodes, I'm going to describe individually first opportunistic locking and then pessimistic locking and, and show uh, why they work and what you have to do to get them to work.